I was a Marine with 1-1 Weapons Company, 81's platoon out in Camp Pendleton, California. Ra <laughs> I joined a few months after September 11th, feeling like I think most people in the country did at the time, filled with a sense of patriotism and retribution and the desire to do something. That coupled with the fact I wasn't doing anything. I was uh, 17, just graduated from high school that past summer, living in the back room of my parents' house, paying rent in the small town I was raised in northern Indiana called Mishawaka. I could spell that later for people who are interested. <laughs> Mishawaka is many good things, but cultural hub of the world it is not. So my only exposure to theater and film was limited to the plays I did in high school and, and blockbuster video. May she rest in peace. Uh, <laughs> I was serious enough about acting that I auditioned for Juilliard when I was a senior in high school. Didn't get in, determined college wasn't for me and applied nowhere else, which is a genius move. I also did that uh, Hail Mary L.A. acting odyssey that I always heard stories about of actors moving to L.A. with like seven dollars and finding work and successful careers. I got as far as Amarillo, Texas before my car broke down. I spent all my money repairing it. Finally made it to Santa Monica, not even L.A. Stayed for 48 hours wandering the beach, basically. Got in my car, drove home, thus ending my acting career. So, <laughs> 17, Mishawaka, parents' house, paying rent, selling vacuums. Uh, telemarketing, cutting grass at the local 4-H fairgrounds. This was my world going into September 2001. So after the 11th and feeling an overwhelming sense of duty and just being pissed off in general at myself, my parents, the government, you know, not having confidence, not having a respectable job, my shitty mini fridge that I just drove to California and back, I joined the Marine Corps and I loved it. I love being a Marine. It's one of the things I'm most proud of having done in my life. Firing weapons was cool. Driving and detonating expensive things was great. But I found I loved the Marine Corps the most for the thing I was looking for the least when I joined, which was the people. These weird dudes, a, a motley crew of characters from a cross-section of the United States that on the surface I had nothing in common with. And over time, all the political and personal bravado that led me to the military dissolved. And for me, the Marine Corps became synonymous with my friends. And then a few years into my service and months away from deploying to Iraq, I dislocated my sternum in a mountain biking accident and had to be medically separated. And for those who were never in the military, they find this hard to understand. But then being told I wasn't going to deploy to Iraq or Afghanistan was very devastating for me. It's a very clear image of leaving the base hospital on a stretcher and my entire platoon was waiting outside to see if I was OK. And then suddenly I was a civilian again. I knew I wanted to give acting another shot because, again, this is me, I thought all civilian problems are small compared to the military. I mean, what can you really bitch about now? You know, it, it's hot. Someone should dirt on the air conditioner. You know, this coffee line is too long. I, I was a Marine. I knew how to survive. I would go to New York and become an actor, and if things didn't work out, I'd, I'd live in Central Park and dumpster dive behind Panera Bread. <laughs> so I, I re-auditioned for Juilliard, and this time I was lucky enough I got in. But I was surprised by how complex the transition was from military to civilian. And I was relatively healthy. I can't imagine going through that process on top of a mental or physical injury. But regardless, it was difficult, in part, because I was in acting school, I couldn't justify going to voice and speech class, throwing imaginary balls of energy at the back of the room, doing acting exercises where I gave birth to myself while <laughs> my friends were serving without me overseas. Um, but also because I didn't know how to apply the things I learned in the military to a civilian context. I mean that both practically and emotionally. Pr practically, I had to get a job. And I was an infantry ma marine where you're shooting machine guns and firing mortars. There's not a lot of places you can put those skills in the civilian world. <laughs> and emotionally in that, I struggled to find meaning. In the military, everything has meaning. Everything you do is either steeped in tradition or has a practical purpose. And you can't smoke in the field because you don't want to give away your position. You don't touch your face because you have to maintain a personal level of health and hygiene. You face this way when colors plays out of respect to those people who went before you. You walk this way because of this. You talk this way because of this. Your uniform is worn and maintained to the inch, and how diligently you followed those rules spoke volumes about the kind of Marine you were. Your rank said something about your history and the respect you had earned. In the civilian world, there's no rank. Here, you're just another body. And I felt like I constantly had to prove my worth all over again. And the respect civilians were giving me while I was in uniform didn't exist while I was out of it. There didn't seem to be a, um, a sense of community. Whereas in the military, I felt this sense of community. How often in the civilian world, are you put in a life or death situation when you, with your closest friends and they constantly demonstrate that they're not going to abandon you? And meanwhile, at acting school, <laughs> uh, 
I was really, for the first time, discovering playwrights and characters and plays that had nothing to do with the military, but were somehow describing my military experience in a way that before to me was indescribable. And I felt myself becoming less aggressive as I was able to put words to feelings for the first time and realizing what a valuable tool that was. And when I was reflecting on my time in the military, I wasn't first thinking on the stereotypical drills and discipline and pain of it, but rather these small, intimate, human moments, these moments of great feeling. Friends going AWOL because they miss their families, friends getting divorced, grieving together, celebrating together, all within the backdrop of the military. And I saw my friends battling these circumstances, and I watched the anxiety it produced in them and me not being able to express our feelings about it. And, and the military and theater communities are actually very similar. You have a group of people trying to accomplish a mission greater than themselves. It's not about you. You have a role. You have to know your role within that team. Every team has a leader or director. Sometimes they're smart, sometimes they're not. You're forced to be intimate with, with complete strangers in a short amount of time, the, the self-discipline, the self-maintenance. Uh, I thought, how great would it be to create a space that combined these two seemingly dissimilar communities, that brought entertainment to a group of people that, considering their occupation, could handle something a bit more thought-provoking than the typical mandatory fun events that I remember being voluntold to go to in the military. <laughs> all well-intended but slightly offensive events like win a date with a San Diego Chargers cheerleader where you answer questions about pop culture and if you get it right you win a date which is a chaperone walk around the parade deck with this you know already married pregnant cheerleader and <laughs> nothing against cheerleaders I love cheerleaders the, the point is more how great would it be to have theater presented through characters that were accessible without being condescending so we started this nonprofit called Arts in the Armed Forces where, where we tried to do that tried to join these two seemingly dissimilar communities. We, we pick a play or select monologues from contemporary American plays that are diverse in age and race, like a military audience is, grab a group of incredible theater-trained actors, arm them with incredible material, keep production value as minimal as possible, no sets, no costumes, no lights, just reading it, to throw all the emphasis on the language and to show that theater can be created at any setting. It's a powerful thing, getting in a room with complete strangers and reminding us uh, ourselves of our humanity and that self-expression is just as valuable a tool as a rifle on your shoulder. And for an organization like the military that prides itself on having acronyms for acronyms can get lost in the sauce when it comes to explaining a collective experience. And I can think of no better community to arm with a new means of self-expression than those protecting our country. So we've gone all over the United States and the world from Walter Reed in Bethesda, Maryland to Camp Pendleton to Camp Arif John in Kuwait to USAG Bavaria, on and off Broadway theaters in New York. And for the performing artists we bring, you know, it's a window into a culture that they otherwise would not have had exposure to. And for the military, it's the exact same. And in doing this for the past six years, I'm always reminded that acting is many things. It's a craft, it's a political act, it's a business, it's um, whatever adjective I guess is most applicable to you, but it's also a service. I didn't get to finish mine. So whenever I get to be of service to this ultimate service industry, the military, for me, again, there's not many things better than that. Uh, thank you. So we're going to be uh, doing a, a piece from Marco Ramirez called I Am Not Batman. Uh, incredible actor and good friend of mine, Jesse Perez, is going to be reading. And Matt Johnson, who I just met a couple hours ago, they're kind of doing it together really for the first time, so we'll see how it goes. So Jesse Perez and Matt Johnson. It's the middle of the night and the sky is glowing like mad radioactive red. And if you squint, you can maybe see the moon through a thick layer of cigarette smoke and airplane exhaust that covers the whole city like a mosquito net that won't let the angels in. And if you look up high enough, you could see me standing on the edge of an 87-story building. And up there, a place for gargoyles and broken clock towers that have stayed still and dead for maybe like a hundred years. Up there is me. And I'm freaking Batman. And I got Batmobiles and Batarangs and frickin' Batcaves, like, for real. And all it takes is a broom closet or a back room or a fire escape, and Danny's hand-me-down jeans are gone. And my navy blue polo shirt, the one that looks kind of good on me but has that hole on it near the butt from when it got snagged on the chain-link fence behind Arturo's, but it isn't even a big deal because I tucked that part in and it's, like, all good. That blue polo shirt, it's gone too. And I get, like, like, transformational. 
And nobody pulls out a belt and whips Batman for talking back or for not talking back. And nobody calls Batman simple or stupid or skinny. And nobody fires Batman's brother from the Eastern Taxi Company because they was making cutbacks neither. Because they got nothing but respect. And not like afraid respect, just like respect, respect. Because nobody's afraid of you. Because Batman doesn't mean nobody no harm. Ever. Because all Batman really wants to do is save people and maybe pay Abuela's bills one day and die happy and maybe get like mad famous, for real. Oh, and kill the Joker. Tonight, like most nights, I'm all alone, and I'm watching, and I'm waiting, like an eagle, or like a, no, yeah, like an eagle. <laughs> and my cape is flapping in the wind because it's freaking long, and my pointy ears are on, and that mask that covers like half my face is on too, and I got like bulletproof stuff all in my chest so no one can hurt me, and nobody, nobody is going to come between Batman and justice. From where I am, I could hear everything. Somewhere in the city, there's an old lady picking styrofoam leftovers up out of a trash can, and she's putting a piece of sesame chicken someone spit out into her own mouth. And somewhere, there's a doctor with a whack haircut and a black lab coat trying to find a cure for the diseases that are going to make us all extinct for real one day. And somewhere, there's a man, a man in a janitor's uniform, stumbling home drunk and dizzy after spending half his paycheck on 40-ounce bottles of twist-off beer and the other half on a four-hour visit to some lady's house on a street where the lights have all been shot out by people who'd rather do what they do in this city in the dark. And half a block away from janitor man, there's a group of good-for-nothings who don't know no better, waiting for janitor man with rusted bicycle chains and imitation Louisville sluggers, and if they don't find a scent on him, which they won't, they'll just pound at him till the muscles in their arms start burning, till there's no more teeth to crack out. But they don't count on me. They don't count on no dark night with the stomach full of grocery store brand macaroni and cheese and cut-up Vienna sausages. Because they'd rather believe I don't exist. And from 87 stories up, I could hear one of the good for nothing say, give me the cash, real fast like that, just give me the fucking cash. And I see janitor man mumble something in drunk language and turn pale. And from 87 stories up, I could hear his stomach trying to hurl its way out of his dickies. So I swoop down like mad fast and I'm like darkness, I'm like swoosh. And I throw a batarang at the one naked light bulb. And they're all like, whoa, motherfucker, who just turned out the lights? <laughs> What's that over there? What? Give me what you got, old man. Did anybody hear that? Hear what? There ain't nothing. No, really, there ain't no bat. But then, one out of the three good for nothing gets it to the head. Bow! And number two swings blindly into the dark cape before him. But, but before his fist hits anything, I grab a trash can lid and right in the gut and number one comes back with the jump kick but i know judo karate too so i'm like twice but before i can do any more damage suddenly we all hear a click click and suddenly everything gets quiet and the one good for nothing left standing grips a handgun and aims it straight up like he's holding Jesus hostage, like he's threatening maybe to blow a hole in the moon. And the good for nothing who got it to the head who tried to jump kick me and the other good for nothing who got it in the gut is both scrambling back away from the dark figure before him. And the drunk man, the janitor man, is huddled in a corner praying to St. Anthony because that's the only one he could remember. And there's me, eyes glowing white, cape blowing softly in the wind. Bulletproof chest heaving, my heart beating right through it in a Morse code for fuck with me just once, come on, just try. And the one good for nothing left standing, the one with the handgun, yeah, he laughs and he lowers his arm and he points it at me and gives the moon a break and he aims it right between my pointy ears like goalposts and he's special teams. And janitor man is still calling St. Anthony, but he ain't picking up. And for a second, it seems like maybe I'm going to lose. Nah! Shoot! Shoot! Fuakata! Don't kill me, man! Snap! Wrist crack! Neck! Slash! Skin meets acid! Ah! 
and he's on the floor and I'm standing over him and I got the gun in my hands now and I hate guns. I hate holding them because I'm Batman. And Asterix, Batman don't like guns because his parents got iced by guns a long time ago. But for just a second, my eyes glow white and I hold this thing for I could speak to the good for nothing in a language he maybe understands. Click, click. And the good for nothings become good for disappearing into whatever toxic waste, chemical sludge, shithole they crawled out of. And it's just me and janitor man. And I pick him up and I wipe sweat and cheap perfume off his forehead. And he begs me not to hurt him, and I grab him tight by his janitor man shirt collar, and I pull him to my face, and he's taller than me, but the cape helps, so he listens when I look him straight in the eyes, and I say two words to him, go home. And he does, checking behind his shoulder every 10 feet, and I swoosh from building to building on his way there, because I know where he lives, and I watch his hands tremble as he pulls out his keychain and opens the door to his building. And I'm back in bed before he even walks in through the front door. And I hear him turn on the faucet and pour himself a glass of warm tap water. And he puts the glass back in the sink. And I hear his footsteps. And they get slower as they get to my room. And he creaks my door open like mad slow. And he takes a step in, which he never does. And he's staring off into nowhere, his face the color of sidewalks in summer. And I act like I'm just waking up and I say, oh, what's up, Pop? And janitor man says nothing to me. But I see in the dark, I see his arms go limp and his head turns back like towards me. And he lifts it for I could see his face, for I could see his eyes. And his cheeks is dripping, but not with sweat. And he just stands there breathing like he remembers my eyes glowing white, like he remembers my bulletproof chest, like he remembers he's my Pop. And for a long time, I don't say nothing. And he turns around, hand on the doorknob, and he ain't looking my way. But I hear him mumble two words to me. I'm sorry. And I lean over and I open my window just a crack. If you look up high enough, you could see me. And from where I am, I could hear everything. Thank you.